I gotta ask, what what do you make of the Republican rebuttal by Senator oh Britt? <laughs> I, Go on. I was stunned. <laughs> well, it was like the Democrats night, we thought it couldn't get better. And then yeah. Katie Britt comes on. I was like, this is this heaven? Have I gotten there? Um, <laughs> am I about to defend my life with Albert Brooks up here? Jess, where does this podcast find you? Um, I'm home in New York. Nice. Uh, so let's bust right into it. It's been a week since Biden's State of the Union. What have been your biggest takeaways, not only in terms of the talk, but the reaction to it? I guess the biggest takeaway is how hungry the American public was for Biden to seem like he can do the job. Like Everyone was kind of waiting with bated breath for will there be this moment that could put, you know, Ezra Klein's concerns aside and a lot of their own concerns about his age and his mental fitness. And you're asking a lot of someone at the, in that age bracket, I know you've talked about this before, to give you five more years of the hardest job on the planet. And I think there was this collective sigh of relief. We've seen a little bit of a bump in the polling from it, but more just everyone's psyche is a little bit lighter about it. Uh, when you talk to people, they're like, okay, we can do this. Yeah, it feels like he spoke with a vigor and a strength that's totally unbecoming an 81-year-old. <laughs> I mean, just, just, uh, just, just while you said on the five that you, you know the address went well because, quote, the Republicans would have used the age attack and are now basically saying that he's an aggressive uh, partisan. What leg do you think or what will be the Republican go-to now? I think that they'll continue with he doesn't have the temperament for it. So we'll switch from that. Like he vacillates between old man and old man, you know, get off my lawn. They're calling him like old yeller. For instance, I've I've heard tossed around. We'll get a little more of this. Uh, does he take Adderall? Some people going so far as the co- the cocaine bag in the White House was actually his. Um Adderall is completely legal. If he is taking Adderall, I really don't mind um, at this point. But I think that they'll, and we'll see the fallout from special counsel Hur's testimony, um, which is going on about Biden holding classified documents and that he didn't charge him because he's an, a nice elderly man or something like that. And people will play around with that. But Above all else, I feel like they won't go to the issues, which is really where they have the highest chance to win. And that's where Democrats can make up a lot of ground by just focusing on that for the moment. So you actually have a background in data and consulting. And I want to see if you agree with this thesis and then ask a specific question. My thesis is the national polls, especially now, are literally meaningless. That They're fun to look at, but they just mean almost nothing. If you look at you know, I think Herman Cain was polling <laughs> at the top at this point 12 or 16 years ago. It kind of comes down to five states. Have you done any research or do you have any thoughts around what is or is not happening in those actually small number of counties in those swing states? Not necessarily on the county level. I think it's a little early for that, but definitely it's kind of five to seven states that decide all of it. And you know how important it is from where everyone is going for their early campaign stops, right? Like they're showing up in Pennsylvania, they're showing up in Georgia, they're showing up in Wisconsin. Um, They're raising money in New York and California, but we're really only good for dollars, right? Um, Otherwise, if you want to be persuadable, you're going to the place where there actually are persuadable voters. Um, In terms of focus, let's say on the big cities, that shows the Democrats are concerned, as always, with turning out their base. What will Black voters do? What will Latino voters do? What will young voters do? Um, And Donald Trump is holding his campaigns in more rural areas, for instance, where his voters tend to be. So you can see the beginnings of it. But I wouldn't say that the polls are totally meaningless because trend lines matter, right? Like we look back to 2020 and a lot of the kind of big honcho pollsters like the Nate Cones of the world, the Nate Silvers of the world have been referencing the fact that Biden never trailed Trump in 2020. So we are seeing a little bit of a difference in terms of how the electorate is responding to these two four years later. And I think that that is meaningful because you need to change your behavior as a result of it. It doesn't mean Joe Biden's going to lose. But if you see enough polling that says, for instance, he's a little soft with X demographic, like black men, for instance, is something that always comes up. Black women, no problem. They're showing up. 
they're jazzed about it. They're ready to vote for Biden-Harris. Black men, there have been all of these, quote, barbershop tours, focus grouping, um, where they're hearing, like, I don't know, what has he really done for me? Kind of the Charlemagne the God argument, which basically says Donald Trump is an insurrectionist. I'm not interested in that, but I really want to see the brass tacks of what Biden has delivered. And so you know, because that's showing up in this early polling, that that's a soft area for you and you've got to pay attention. So that's where I think that it's meaningful, just like a snapshot of time. You know, mid-March, these are our issues. Mid-April, these are our issues. Mid-May, et cetera. And then you hope by September, October that you don't have those issues anymore. Let's talk a little bit about demographics. Uh, my sense is, I mean, we take for granted, we think that the nation is a static organism, and it isn't. The populace and the nation has changed since 2016. A lot of people have died, and there's a lot of new voters. And my sense is, and again, I just might be talking my own book or you know, engaging in confirmation bias, but does, don't the demographic shifts favor Biden in that the people who've died are mostly older, white, mostly conservatives? Whereas the new voters are going to be mostly non-white and lean left. Don't the demographics foot well to Biden right now? They definitely do if everyone is engaged. I mean, it's, it's like the stupid truism about elections. You know, it should go this way if everybody turns out. But we know that that's the biggest threat, certainly, that the Democrats are facing. Kamala Harris gave an interview a couple of weeks ago where she said, we're not really afraid of Donald Trump. We're afraid of the couch. Right. That it's bad weather that day and you're just going to sit at home. I was in Iowa for the caucus. Um, it was like a month ago, a month and a half ago. And it was the coldest day in, I don't know, 50 years. They had really low turnout. Now, it didn't matter on the Democratic side. It really only mattered for Republicans who were actually having a competition. But you saw really depressed turnout as a result of that. But overall, yes, about the demographics. But we are seeing this uptick. In a little bit of conservatism, especially like if you look at an issue, an issue like Israel Hamas, which we've talked about before, um, where you can see minority voters leaning a bit more to the right than you would expect or that I would like. And that's something that the Democrats really need to work on catering to. And so you're advising, they say, all right, Jess, you're data-driven, smart, pragmatic. We want you to advise us on the two or three core messages of our platform. Do that for the Republican Party right now. Do that. You're a hired gun. I mean, even with the billion, billion and a half bucks each, each party is going to raise for the presidential race, they have finite capital and they have to zero in on a couple messages. What do you think those messages are for each of the candidates? I think for the Democrats, and I hate to say this because it's such an important issue and one that really matters to me, I think we really got away get away from talking about per saving democracy. That January 6th isn't something that works for people anymore. That's kind of baked in that they think it was an insurrection, attempted coup, et cetera. And you have to talk about these, frankly, really boring things. Um, my friends run a very cool polling firm called Slingshot Strategies, and they're doing all this work for Reid Hoffman. And they've found that talking about things like preserving Social Security and Medicare, um, you know, creating good jobs, protecting a woman's right to choose bodily autonomy, that's really what you have to be talking about. And if you are not focused on issues that matter for everyday people, like it's a privilege to sit around saying like, oh, do you do you remember this exact detail of what happened on January 6th? Or can you believe Trump said this at a rally? People, real people glaze over, right? They're still in the phase where they know that their prices are a bit up. Um, they're going down, they're going in the right direction. But I said the other day, you know, having a campaign slogan of we've had the best recovery in the G7, it's just not sexy, right? No one is putting that on a bumper sticker. Um, so the real brass tax kind of stuff. Again, the entitlements are huge, um, not just for older voters, but matter to younger voters. It's interesting also how much the debt and deficit um, ranks as important things that people want to talk about. No one actually wants to rein them in, but people love to hear that kind of stuff. So I would like a campaign that was pretty boring. Entitlement reform, you know, uh, or protecting entitlements or or ensuring, you know, it, they, they always couch entitlement reform and let's put in a lockbox and make sure that it's right. around for a long time. At the same time, you know, we're spending six and a half trillion or seven trillion dollars a year when we have five trillion in receipts. So people are concerned about debt and deficit. Yet the two don't square up, right? And do you, do you think that you these are talking points or do you think that 
the nation is ready for the hard truth about uh, do we need to raise taxes or cut cut entitlements? The answer is yes. I mean, all roads lead to the same place with this level of deficit spending. Do you think that the public is ready for that type of uh, you know, straight talk, or it's more just jazz hands, talk about the debt, but also say we, we need to save Social Security. To me, those are just diametrically opposed. It's interesting. They're ready to talk about it when they're polled on it. So my old boss actually did a ton of work uh, for the Simpson Bowles Commission, which is probably the most sensible commission that we've had in decades. And people are willing to give a little if it means saving on the other side, right? They are genuinely concerned about the debt and the deficit, understand there has to be some personal sacrifice, whether that's means testing, for instance, or just rich people saying like, I should forego this. There's no reason that I should get a couple thousand dollars from the government when I live in Malibu and everything is great, for instance. Um, that does not work in an election. It's like all morals go <laughs> flying out the door. And voters then don't want to hear it. It's a very select group that can continue to have these very sensible conversations when they're actually picking their candidates. Um, so you are completely correct, and it will never change in an election year, uh, that people want to hear, like, nothing will ever be taken away from you. And, you know, if we have to print more money, it's worth it. And stimulus is the way to go. And the Biden administration has a pretty strong argument for it, actually, that the investment in the country has really benefited us. And now do Republicans. Well, the messaging that they are going to go with is definitely this border security issue, which is the number one issue now across the board and for a lot of independents. I was surprised to see how many Nikki Haley voters, um, so kind of moderate Republicans and independents, uh, were into that. Same thing happened in 2018. Remember when the caravans first came around um, and then they miraculously disappeared the day after the election? I don't know how that's, uh, that's feasible, but they're going to go and they probably should for what they're base wants, talk about border security and crime and policing, and then the economy. The problem is with the economy is that they're really struggling to make the metrics work for them right now. And a lot of Republicans who are maybe being more honest about it, like even Larry Kudlow, who worked in the Trump administration, has given some of the more enthusiastic two thumbs up uh, for what we're seeing in terms of the economy with job reports, with wage growth fighting back inflation, et cetera. Um, so I think it's a difficult road. I think for them, they need to stay away, though, from all social issues. They can't even touch them. If they're not willing to revise their platform and say things like climate change is real or maybe kids don't deserve to die while they're sitting in a classroom or maybe uh, heartbeat bills are a little archaic or ridiculous, they're going to get pummeled. I got to ask, what what do you make of the Republican rebuttal by Senator oh Britt? <laughs> <laughs> I, go on i was stunned <laughs> well it was like the democrats night we thought it couldn't get better and then yeah. katie brick comes on first of all we see you we hear you and we stand with you i was like this is this heaven have I gotten there? Um, <laughs> am I about to defend my life with Albert Brooks up here? Um, I, I don't understand because she's actually very competent and very smart. I've seen her give a bunch of interviews. She's charming. She's exactly what the Republican Party needs, right? Like uh, she's 42, I think, has two kids. She's married to a strapping football player, Alabama values. Central blah, blah, casting, blah. yeah. And whoever coached her, because they must have— send someone in to do that, uh, did her a grave disservice. And then it comes down to the basics. And they just, they gave her a bunch of junk to say. I mean, the story about the poor woman who was sex trafficked through Mexico that she made During the out, Bush like, administration. Had, <laughs> right, 20 years ago, which does not make it yeah. any yeah. better, I guess, or yeah, worse. And how's it Biden's which, fault? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, um... Now you have that woman speaking out against her, and it totally deflated the sales out of the Lake and Riley story, the tragedy out of Georgia, where the young nursing student was killed by an undocumented guy, or I should say illegal if I was Biden, though now he has backtracked on that. And, you know, everyone's talking about that, and then we're all watching SNL and thinking Scarlett Johansson 
is funnier than Colin Jost. And, you know, <laughs> she's the savior of all of this. And um, I mean, I don't know if the reports are true, but apparently internally the Republicans are really freaking out that that's what they put up there on a night where Biden also looked so strong. We'll be right back. I, I, I want to talk about you, Jess. You're, uh, this is going to sound uh, very sycophant. I think you're a fantastic role model for young women. I would just like to know, like, how, uh, give us the cliff notes on, on your career and what kind of the biggest influences were on how you got to where you are at such a young age. So I moved to London after college. I did my junior year abroad there, moved back to London and went to the London School of Economics and did a couple of master's degrees and a PhD that was focused on the impact of political scandal on politicians' careers. Um, it all started from a love of Bill Clinton. Um, I have since revised a little bit in the Me Too era yeah, and my level of adulation, but yeah. <laughs> I'm very in the Clinton camp in terms of what they were able to accomplish and what kind of politician he was, you know, someone who really just excites you. And that's something, you know, obviously he and Obama have had. And I think part of what Joe Biden's struggles are, right, is that he's not a generational talent in the same way. But I thought, oh, if I could figure out a formula for what you have to put into an apology to get out of a jam like the one Bill Clinton was in, I would have like the coolest consulting firm of all time. So I was going to create it's this crisis like, apology right? matrix. Yeah. yeah, crisis management. Anyway, it didn't work out. Um, there aren't enough examples to do it that way. So I did a big quantitative study, which is the beginning of my uh, data background, looking at two different UK parliaments. I finished up. I went to work on a political campaign actually for Boris Johnson. Um, he was running against Ken Livingston, who, if you know... London politics. Uh, he was the mayor of London, a crazy anti-Semite. Um, and obviously what conservative and liberal mean over there is very different than here. So I did that campaign, moved back here, and went to work in political polling, mostly on issue campaigns, um, like for Mike Bloomberg. And then I started going on air in about 2014, 2015. And my old boss, who was Bill Clinton's pollster in the 90s, actually pushed me to do more conservative media. Not only does it kind of sharpen your skills, he said they need good people out there representing our point of view. And so I started going on Fox and they liked me and I liked them. And I have been there formally since the 2016 election and became the co-host of The Five uh, a little more than two years ago. You represent a new trend, and that is typically when there's these group or panel media shows, what they would do is if they were conservative, they'd bring on what I would call a foil or someone who made them look good. Like, yeah. remember Hannity Combs? Whatever you think about yeah. Sean Hannity, he's smart and he's charismatic. Sean Combs was not. I remember The View had Cindy McCain, and I thought Cindy McCain just helped them make their points. And what I have found interesting, and it's a testament to Fox, is um, and a testament to The View, is I think of, and I think um, Alyssa Farah is of the same generation. They said, you know what? When we bring on smart people to push back on us, it just makes the whole show better. Anyways, your thoughts? Well, I... You agree. I don't want to, you know, people who have <laughs> sat in this seat prior, um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for, and they also, you know, built these brands that have become so iconic and that I'm benefiting from. Um, but I think that there was definitely a trend towards having either someone more shrill or someone more moderate, you know, in the seat where there could be a lot of kind of nod and smile, I agree with what you're saying, or shying away from a fight. And I think that part of the reason that it works and that Alyssa does such a good job, and I totally agree with you about that, is there's also some intergenerational fire. And that's something that's really important about what's going on right now, that you have a lot of older people still in positions of power that are telling younger people what they should think about X, Y, or Z issue, right? And it's important to represent the ethos of a generation, to be able to speak authentically 
for people who are in their 30s, though. I just turned 40 last weekend, so I have a, I have a whole new decade to speak for. Um, but I think that that's part of it. And then it's also the balance between, you know, what kind of environment you want to create for your audience that might like to live in a safe space versus also what rates and what expands the bubble. And that's a lot of the internet clip culture. Like, I know, for instance, that The Five... Uh, the show that I co-host has the highest share of Democratic viewership. It's about 22, 23 percent, but also that majority of people who, quote, like me, right, or think that I do something cool or important are not traditional Fox viewers, and they're accessing me through TikTok and YouTube and Instagram and, to some degree, uh, Twitter or X, whatever we're supposed to call it. And that gives what you know, what we're doing right now, and I should say <laughs> that Harold Ford Jr., the former congressman, also we share the seat. So we do it um, half the week is me, half the week is him. And I think it's great for the viewers to get to see more of like a blue dog Democrat and then also like a more kind of modern Democrat um, out there representing the point of view. But people are just not ingesting TV in the same way. Even with The View, you know, it's 11 a.m. How many people can be sitting at home watching The View? Mostly people who are stay-at-home or retired. I mean, the average cable news uh, viewer is, what, 66 Dad. to 69? <laughs> they're, they're, I heard Fox is 69. Oh, wait. I did the math on this once. Maybe it's 63. So every 43-year-old who's watching Fox, there's an 80, there's an 83-year-old. CNN brags because theirs is like 55. It's really, it's Isn't shocking. Is that young? Old. Oh, I would still think it was kind of later 60s. It could, I mean, it could be, but also the numbers aren't that fantastic as well. So um, without doing kind of a ratings brag, um, you know, people are, and I think that it loops back to the conversation we were having about politics and the independents and the moderates deciding the elections. People are not interested in the kind of circle jerk conversations that we're having. They don't want to see the fights. Remember at the beginning of the Trump era, it was all like Anna Navarro and I forget who she was always paired with. And they were like yelling at each other. Um, that was Crossfire. Yes. Yeah, it was, but it's, like it's, louder and more yeah, aggressive. Angry. And I don't think that that works for people anywhere. They actually want to see a conversation. They want to know that the people that they're watching are being thoughtful about it and prepared. Um, and I think that that's a big shift. Yeah, you definitely... You definitely, you and Alyssa both bring, I think, are great role models for young people thinking about how to disagree in an, not only a civil way, but an effective way. Because whenever I see you respond to what I feel are just kind of ridiculous statements um, by your co-hosts, you don't ever make it personal. You don't ever get loud. You just respond with facts and data and a view. And they all look like they were just caught, you know, stealing something. They all just look, oh, God we've been exposed in the middle of of doing something that's clearly clearly not accurate uh, so a couple things as we wrap up here you're uh the mother of one is that right mother of one until mid-april and then and you're expecting two. yeah yes. I, I knew that but i've been told unless you see the head crowning you never say anything about uh someone who's expecting so i was i was setting yeah, up for you to no, say that's, that that's good advice if and how has being a mother and someone who is expecting changed your view, if at all, on politics, what's important to you, and how you approach your job. Having kids for me was the most fundamental change in my life. And it wasn't like instant. I mean, actually, it was instant. When my first child was born, I immediately freaked out that I didn't have my money. But it also that just definitely ch- happens. Oh yeah. my God. It's like, oh shit, I'm successful and I need to make a lot more money. Anyways, um, Talk to me about how it's changed your view of the world at large and, 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 and specifically how you think about politics in our country. Well, it makes you more forward thinking, right? Like you're before we were expecting, you know, you think about like what amazing vacation are we going to take next year, right? Like, yeah, who I are we having brunch with? Safari. I call it that. How can my, I call it the how can my weekend be more fabulous? That was my focus before. Oh I my God, kids. totally. And, you're like young, living in New York City. You have enough money for any brunch you want and like any great trip. And suddenly you're 
retirement means something. You're being swarmed with information about 529s. You start to think about all of these things that we did, like higher education. I mean, I'm one of the more overeducated people, uh, certainly even in my friend group. And I went to private school in New York City. And I'm thinking like, well, what if she wants to do a PhD, right? What, what if she wants to go to med school? What if all these things need to happen? What do I need to do? The being more successful part, but also what does the world look like for her? And it sounds like a cliche, but it just changes. And you start to reimagine lives purely based on what will be better for these little people. Like, we could make it work from anywhere. I mean, you're said, I don't know exactly where you are right this second, but you have a very international life. I don't know if you're in London or New York or you're still in Austin. Austin, or Texas. You're still in Austin. Mm -hmm. Right. And you're hooked up and you're doing this and you don't have to miss a beat for your lives. But your boys have... A whole ecosystem that matters to them, from their friends to their academics to the kind of culture that you want to raise them in. I thought a lot about how do I get back to Europe? I, I still think that it's better to raise children there. You know, on the weekend, like, do I want to go to Paris or do I want to go to Philadelphia? I love Philly, but that's, that's a tough one. Same. That's this a tough, tough one. <laughs> hmm. If you want a cheesesteak, I guess you have yeah, to go with the Philly yeah. option. Um, yeah. But then you do think about, like, I'm not some climate change radical, but you do think about the quality of the earth. I think a lot about, obviously, reproductive freedom. I'm going to have two daughters. You know, what happens if they go to college in a state that's not going to let them get the care that they need? You know, girls sometimes get pregnant in college and they sometimes don't want to have that baby or something terrible happens, you know, and family plan. Anyway, I don't need to give you a whole Dobbs recitation. but. Everything becomes more forward-looking, and everything becomes less about you. I have never cared about myself less in life it's than so, when I've had a child. Hundred percent. It's the way I describe it is: for the first time in your life, you are legitimately, instinctively, and naturally more concerned with something else more so than you. And I found it actually quite. It's there's a lot of anxiety. I got to make more money. I, if I fail, I fail for this thing too. But it's actually quite liberating, and um, I, find, I find it relaxing. It's like, by Thursday, I was like, how do I hang out with more fabulous people, have more relevance, make more money? And now it's like, well, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to soccer practice and taking them to some... It's, just, it's somewhat liberating you're, you're, to think about something else just automatically. It's like your life is redefined in a pretty positive way. It's hard the first couple of years, especially if you're like me and you're selfish, yeah, there's so much you're saying that's, that I relate to. I lived in New York with my partner and kids. And I remember when our second one came along, I'm like, well, we want to send them to Grace Church or First Presbyterian because we're narcissists and we want to be able to tell our friends at birthday parties that, oh, we're First Presbyterian or Grace Church family. It was $58,000. Plus, in the interview, they ask you if you're philanthropic, which is code for how much money are you going to give us? Are you giving to me? Not to yeah. other causes. Yeah, yeah. Not, they don't care about Planned Parenthood. They're like, how much money are you going to give us at the auction? And so I thought, okay, uh, pre-tax, I'm going to have to make another quarter of a million dollars a year or $200,000 a year to have two kids in this city. And I moved to Florida. And I did it for a lot of reasons. Their grandparents are there. But some of it was economic. I just thought, okay, if I can have a remote lifestyle, and I can, I'm blessed with that, I can... My cars, my house, my plane travel, everything can be paid for in tax savings. And, it, and then in terms of Europe, the reductive analysis I've made is I think you should stick. I'm really good at living other people's lives, Jess, so call me anytime you want me to tell you how to dictate your life. But America is still the best place to make money. Europe is the best place to spend it. Although the, the real gift with purchase of living in London is that, you know, school shootings, trans rights, um, a woman's rights. These aren't even conversations in London. We're like, well, of course a woman should have rights to family planning. Of course we're not going to have a salt wet. It's not even a conversation. They're like, they look at us and they kind of cock their head. And, and But also to be clear, seven of 10 companies that have gone public in the UK in the last 10 years are below their offering price. The UK hasn't grown in five years. There's just money matters and there's not the same opportunities for economic security there are in the UK. So my net advice is, Keep killing it, bank some money in the US, move to a low tax state, bank more money, and then move to London. Boom. You see, it's all figured out, Jess. I'll just it's go on the Galloway out. plan. 
There you go. There you go. Right. Right. That solved train. all of my problems. If you could check, also check, give check. birth for me next month, that would be great as well because that's pretty icky. You know, a few more ketamine trips I might try. Um, <laughs> so, uh, last question, and I know this is something uh, near and dear for both of us. And I'm, I'm having trouble. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about Israel. I'm having trouble reconciling how to thread the needle of speaking openly and honestly about how we feel about it while recognizing the very real concerns that, uh, it, quite frankly, it's turned me off the far left. It's, it's almost taken me from center left to center right. It's created really strange bedfellows here. But I, I'm curious, one, if you're willing to talk about it personally, how it's impacted you personally, but also how do you think it plays out in the election? I can't tell if this is going to help Biden or Trump. What are your thoughts? So, two-part answer, I guess. Um, I'll start with the election part of it first. So, I think it's basically a nothing for Trump. I, I, I don't think he's actually touched the issue. It, I expected mu much more, actually, out of him. He came, came out of the gate pretty terribly criticizing BB, which I, I myself am very critical of him, but to the people who would support Trump because of Israel, that was a major no-no. And he he doesn't really talk about it anymore at all. Um, in terms of for Biden, my hope is that this is not an issue that we are talking about because whatever hostages are alive, and I have very low expectations for how many of them are still alive or in kind of any sort of good working condition. Um, obviously, the reports from the child psychologists to the general practitioners of what they have seen on these hostages that have been freed are so harrowing that you it makes you wonder if these are lives that are going to feel worth living for these people. And that's a total heartbreak. But I don't envision it being what we're going to be talking about come the fall. Um, if Netanyahu can, you know, continues with kind of what he's doing with the settlements and making this about other things besides October 7th, he should be out by then. Um, and you have seen this kind of sea change in the administration, not that there isn't a support for Israel, but that the humanitarian crisis in Gaza has gotten so enormous that Biden cannot afford to just stand there and say, Israel, you do whatever you need to do anymore. Um, so I, I don't foresee it being being a thing at this particular moment, you know, in Dearborn, Michigan. Is it a thing? For sure. Um, is it going to be when you see those two candidates' names on the ballot? I, I just don't see it. Jessica Tarlov is a co-host on The Five, Fox's weeknight news program. She also offers political analysis across FNC and Fox Business Networks, FBN, programming. Jessica is also the vice president of research and consumer insight for Bustle Digital Group. She joins us from her home in Manhattan. Just. I was asked uh, by my my superiors at Vox if you could co-host a podcast with anyone, who would it be? And I said the woman who showed me up on Bill Maher. I started no. out, I started out not loving you. Jess was the the other panelist on my fourth experience on Bill Maher, and um, to be blunt, I've always done really well on that show, and I love going on the comments and YouTube and getting you know hearing people say how wonderful I am. Except when I was on with you, it was all she's amazing. <laughs> Just for president. Uh, I, I, I meant what I said. I think you are such a fantastic role model for young women and young people. You work hard. You're data-driven. You are incredibly courageous. You do not back down, but you're, you have this nice, thoughtful, caring demeanor about you. You're making a shit ton of money. You're successful. You're married to a big, handsome dude. You're having kids. I just think you're a wonderful role model for young people and an inspiration. And I just... It's so gratifying to see someone like you, this new generation of leadership, just ascend the way you are ascending. So well done and 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 go girl. You go girl. Thank you so much. Um, I think you're fantastic. I was so excited when we got paired on Bill Maher. Um, I did not read the comments, but I doubt that it was all about me. Certainly oh, no, it for was. everyone on my side of the fence, they were like, what is Scott Galloway like? Tell me. Yeah, that. it was, um, it was, trust me. Yeah. Anyways, Jess, uh, have, so have, have a great rest of the week. 